the Advanced Technological Education Program. Evaluate works towards an ATE community in which evaluation is valued, systematic, and used to improve the education of technicians in high-tech fields. We do this through engaging project leaders and evaluators with information, expertise, and tools to advance high-quality evaluation. Be sure to check out the Evaluate website to learn more. The slides from this webinar are already actually available on our website, along with several other resources. You can also download these resources by following the link on the right side of your screen. The recording will be available within a few days, and that will be emailed directly to you. I'm Samantha Hooker, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Lissa wilson Betcho is our presenter today. She's the principal investigator of Evaluate, which is located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. We'd also like to recognize those who have worked behind the scenes to help bring this webinar to you today. They include Maureen Green, our friend in the chat for technical support, Lori Wingate, um, and we also want to thank Elaine Kraft, Pam Silvers, and Emery DeWitt from Mentor Connect for their input in making this webinar. And finally, we thank Carolyn williams Norin, our editor. Before we get started, I want to point out that the views in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Lisa. Thanks, Samantha. Hello, everyone. I hope you are all having a good Wednesday so far. Uh, go ahead and say hello in the chat, introduce yourself and give a quick you know, summary of how you're feeling about your AT proposal. I know in the beginning of the year, it seems like you have a ton of time to get everything done. And then time catches up with us, right? So we're already headed into April next week, which feels terrifying. Um, and I know you all have done a lot of work, but it definitely feels like go time. All right, so we're gonna get into it. We're gonna talk about evaluation plans today. So in particular, really jumping into the nitty gritty of what needs to be in your evaluation proposal and giving you really practical strategies to take away from. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, hide our videos for a little bit just so that we can focus on the slides, but I'll go ahead and turn those videos back on when we get to the question and answer session. Okay. So hopefully you were able to join us um, for the first part of this webinar series, the webinar on evaluation essentials for non-evaluators. And just a quick reminder that the recording and resources from that webinar are up on the Evaluate website. So if you ever need to reference them, they are there. Um, this book of uh, resources for pre-award grant seekers is also available. I'm actually gonna go ahead and put um, an electronic version in the handouts tab. So that should pop up on the right side of your screen. So hopefully you still have your printed version that you got at the Mentor Connect Winter Workshop, but I've also put a link to a digital version over there in the handouts. And actually let's go ahead and launch the slides as well. So you have the slides. All right. So I wanna to start today with just a brief recap, right? Getting kind of all of our heads back into evaluation. So evaluation is fundamentally about learning, learning about what works and what doesn't work in order to improve your project and sharing those learnings back with NSF for accountability. Evaluation also provides evidence about the effectiveness of your project. So NSF does require that all ATE projects be evaluated, not to make your lives busier, but because they truly believe in the value of evaluation. Celeste Carter, the NSF ATE project director states, if you don't evaluate and assess your activities and outcomes, you can't know if the project was successful. She also goes on to say evaluation provides the pro the project team with data to convince others of the success of the project, as well as contributing to the body of knowledge in a particular area of STEM. So I wanna call your attention back to that first sentence, right? If you don't evaluate, you can't know if your project was successful. So as a reminder, evaluation involves four basic steps. First, asking important questions about a project's process and outcomes. Second, gathering evidence that will help to answer those questions. 
Third, interpreting the data collected and then answering the evaluation questions. And fourth, really using those results for learning, right? Using them to improve your project and report back to NSF. So today we're gonna to talk about how to craft an effective evaluation plan for your AT proposals. So as we go along, keep these four steps in mind because we're gonna talk about how best to, to integrate each one of these into your proposal. So at the end of last month's webinar, we talked about two basic paths for procuring an evaluator. Depending on your institution's policies, you might be able to name an evaluator in your AT proposal. If this is your case, you'll be able to collaborate with an evaluator to draft your evaluation plan. Other institutions, they don't allow this, which means that the project team is going to be the primary leader in developing that evaluation plan. So I wanna take a quick poll about how many people find themselves in each of these paths. So Samantha, can you go ahead and launch that poll? And it's gonna show up on the right side of your screen. So given procurement policies at your institution, will you be able to name an evaluator in your NSF AT proposal? So hopefully you've already looked into this, but we also understand if you're still not sure. So we have a, I'm still not sure, response option in there. All right, I see answers coming in. So we have about half of our audience today has responded so far. And most of you are still not quite sure, that's okay. Um, a number of you can name an evaluator, that's great. And then we have one so far that knows they, they need to wait until they're funded to get an evaluator on board. Okay, so that is definitely the first step you wanna take. So if you're still not sure which of these paths you fall into, that's kind of your, your homework as you leave this webinar is the first thing you should do is kind of figure out um, at your institution, you can talk to either the procurement's office or if you have a grants office, anyone that would be involved in creating that contract, you can really walk through, ask some questions about this. So make sure to keep in mind which path you will be taking throughout today's webinar, because if you can't name an evaluator, you are going to be using these strategies that we talk about today to write your own evaluation plans. And if you can name an evaluator, you'll really wanna keep these in mind as you review your plan um, with the evaluator that drafts it. So we're gonna to focus today's webinar on identifying and describing five essential elements of the evaluation plan for AT proposals. So as you know, nearly all types of NSF proposals are limited to 15 pages. So here on the screen, you can see these little page thumbnails and they're images from Evaluate's uh, recently funded proposal. So out of these 15 pages, we dedicated one and a half pages to evaluation. And we typically recommend that any ATE proposal dedicate about one to two pages out of that, those 15 to your evaluation plan. So within these few pages, you should identify who is going to evaluate your project, identify your evaluation questions, describe how you're going to collect data to address your evaluation questions, and explain how you're gonna make sense of those data, right? Note how information from the evaluation will be communicated, right? So whether that's through a report or presentations, and then acknowledge how your project is going to use that information. This is an important part. And finally, you wanna make sure to convey a timeline for the evaluation. So for Evaluate's proposal, we actually included the evaluation timeline along with the project timeline. So you can see this giant one page timeline here. So we're gonna dive into each one of these elements in much more detail, which means we're gonna cover a lot of information today in a short amount of time. So uh, everything we talk about has already been summarized in our ATE evaluation plan checklist. So we really hope that this resource helps you remember what we talk about today, and then really allows you to apply the concepts to your own proposal. And again, you can download that in the handout section. Um, I see a, a question of, is this being recorded? And Samantha already answered it, but as a reminder, this is being recorded and you'll get um, that recording emailed to you in a few days. So 
Ooh, there we go. So let's start with what kinds of information you should share about your evaluator, the evaluator that you selected. So NSF does like to see a specific evaluator named in the proposal who has committed to working on your project. But if you are unable to identify an evaluator in your proposal, remember you are not alone, but also make sure to state why you can't select an evaluator. So really write in there, um, you know, our institutional policies will not allow us to begin talking to contracting with an evaluator in the pre-award stage, because not all NSF reviewers are familiar with those institutional policies. So make sure to be really clear about that. And make sure to talk about your plan for finding an evaluator when the grant is funded. Then you want to, so if you can name an evaluator, you want to make sure to describe their qualifications and how those qualifications match with the evaluation plan for your project. So for example, if you have a highly quantitative evaluation plan, the evaluation, the evaluator needs to show that they have experience in quantitative evaluations. Then you also want to refer to your evaluator's bio sketch and letter of collaborations, which should be uploaded with the proposal as supplementary documents. So maybe you remember our friend Jen from the last webinar. So we're gonna use her ATE proposal to walk through these essential elements of an evaluation plan today. But I wanna give you a brief overview about her idea for an ATE proposal. So, Jen teaches at a community college in an urban area that has a growing sector of food and beverage production plants. So she's been hearing from her industry contacts that they need more welding technicians with experience in sanitary standards and hygienic design for welding with stainless steel. Local companies are really looking to train incumbent workers in food grade welding and will require future employees to be certified before hiring. So Jen thinks this opportunity to meet this industry stand, industry need fits perfectly with NSF's ATE solicitation. So she wants to embed training on sanitary welding into existing courses at her institution. So together, the new curriculum for three courses will allow students to obtain a certificate and be embedded within the associate's program, the associate's degree program. I'm sorry, I just want to double check that my mic is still working. Okay, there we go. So for these, addition, for these additions to be successful, Jen also knows that she will need to train current faculty and upgrade their lab equipment to give students hands-on opportunities. So the first thing Jen did was to call the procurement's office, which deals with contracts at her college. She referred to Evaluate's Evaluator Procurement Process Guide, which we shared in our last webinar, to help her understand what this process might look like. She found out that at her institution, they would allow her to name an evaluator in her proposal. So her next step was to find an evaluator. She used Evaluate's guide to finding and selecting an evaluator to know where and how to search. Next, she conducted interviews with a few evaluators until she found someone that was a right fit for her project. So remember, if you can't hire an evaluator until you've been funded, you're gonna follow this same process after you receive the green light from your institution. Okay, so next in the evaluation plan, you need to identify the evaluation questions. So these questions serve as the foundation for your evaluation. It's really important to consider them carefully from the start. So in this section, make sure to list the key evaluation questions the evaluation will address. These are overarching questions about the project's quality, impact, or effectiveness that the evaluation will answer based on evidence. We're talking about three to seven questions, not 20 or 30 questions. So they should all be about the big picture, not specific counts or measures. You want to be sure to include questions about both your project's implementation and outcomes. And it's important that the evaluation is clearly aligned with the project goals and activities. 
while that might seem pretty obvious, proposed project activities, they change and they shift a lot through the development process. So just make sure that before you submit your final proposal, revisit the evaluation plan and make sure that the evaluation has been updated along the way to match the final activities. So what makes a good evaluation question? So evaluation questions should first be evaluative. So I know this sounds a bit redundant, but a non-evaluation, a non-evaluative question might ask, how many students did the project serve? So this question is asking about a single data point. And if the answer to that question was, for example, the project served 100 students, could we determine if that was good or bad? Well, not necessarily based on just this question. Therefore, the question is not inherent to, inherently evaluative. But if we rephrase our question to ask, what was the project's impact on project enrollment, we could determine whether the project enrollment increased, decreased, or remained the same since the project was implemented. This type of answer is more meaningful and more evaluative than just saying the project served 100 students. Second, good evaluation questions should be reasonable. So this means that the questions are linked to what a program can practically and re realistically achieve or influence. For example, asking whether the project increased hygienic welding employment in the entire state may be an unreasonable expectation of the project given time and resources. So we want to avoid evaluation questions that are outside of the scope or resources of a project. Instead, we might want to ask, to what extent did students served by the project find employment in the hygienic sector? So this question is more suitable to the expectations of the project. Third, good evaluation questions should be specific. So questions should clearly identify what will be investigated in the evaluation. For example, if an evaluation question asks, did the project increase instructor effectiveness? We're left asking, what is instructor effectiveness and how is that going to be measured? What does that really mean? So we don't want vague questions that are stated in these overly broad terms that really introduces unnecessary confusion into the evaluation. Instead, we could be more specific and ask, to what extent did participating instructors increase their knowledge about sanitary welding techniques? This question more clearly states the expectations of the project's outcome. Fourth, good evaluation questions should be answerable. So by this, we mean that the question should be able to be answered given the accessible data and resource constraints. So if we ask, for example, to what extent does the project affect long-term persistence in STEM careers? This re would require long-term tracking and follow-up with students over years, possibly decades. This is not really feasible given a three-year ATE grant. Instead, we might focus on a more short-term um, outcomes, such as to what extent does the project affect students' interests in pursuing a STEM career in the future? So this question is much more feasible to answer given the evaluation within the constraints of an average ATE grant. Finally, when considering a set of evaluation questions, we want to make sure that they are complete in thoroughly addressing the purpose of the evaluation and evaluation users' information needs. So all important aspects of project activities and intended outcomes should be addressed. Mapping evaluation questions to a logic model can really help to ensure the completeness in your evaluation questions. So if you're not already familiar with logic models, they are a way of visually communicating a project's activities and outcomes. Logic models aren't actually required for the ATE program, but they are a really great way to show the overall design of a project, and they can be really useful for evaluation planning. So here you see a few thumbnails of images of various logic models from ATE and other STEM education projects. So let's take a look at what a logic model for Jen's proposal might look like. So a basic logic model typically has the following columns across the top. First, activities, so these are what a project does, creates, or delivers. And then we have short-term, mid-term, and long-term outcomes. 
So every logic model looks a little bit different. And the point of a logic model really is to succinctly communicate what the project will do, so the activities, and what the changes the project intends to bring about through those activities. So these are those outcomes. So as we discussed before, Jen's primary activities include collaborating with local industries to understand their needs, develop content to embed in three welding courses, and develop and offer professional development for faculty, and finally purchase new lab equipment. So from these activities, a new certificate is created and faculty gain knowledge and skills in hygienic welding. With the certificate being offered and faculty trained, we would then expect to see students gaining knowledge and skills in hygienic welding. They will also gain hands-on experience due to the new lab equipment and instruction activities. After engaging with the updated courses, we would expect to see incumbent workers obtaining certificates in hygienic welding and other students in the associate's degree program gaining new skills. Both of these outcomes lead to meeting industry needs around staff skills and future hiring, sorry, and future hiring in hygienic welding. So evaluation questions about activities help a project determine whether they're achieving their targets in terms of measures such as student numbers, diversity, and satisfaction. It's also important to ask questions about project strengths and weaknesses to make sure the evaluation is gathering information that can be used by the project to enhance its quality. The evaluation should also ask questions about short-term outcomes. So what changes do you expect to see after the activities are carried out? This could be um, something like, to what extent has the faculty knowledge of hygienic welding techniques changed? And then what, what are the expected consequences of those changes, right? So you can see this, uh, this logical progression here. So this might be, to what extent have students' knowledge and skills changed? So asking about short-term and midterm outcomes can make a larger argument about the effectiveness of your project rather than simply asking questions about activity counts or satisfaction. It can be really difficult to like adequately ask about long-term outcomes of an ATE project. Because ATE projects, these often involve students obtaining employment and colleges meeting the needs of local industries. For projects that are developing certificates like Gen, it might take longer than a three-year grant period for the first student to go through the program. Therefore, you might not always ask evaluation questions about these really long-term outcomes. So as you can see, our evaluation questions span most columns of our logic model, asking questions about both implementation and outcomes. In your evaluation, you want to make, make the strongest argument possible about the effectiveness of your project. So consider what types of information would convince you as a scientist whether the project has been successful or not. So I know uh, our review of logic models was pretty fast, but Evaluate does have a number of resources on logic models and evaluation questions to help you put this into practice. So first we have a logic model template for ATE projects, which includes question prompts and examples. We also have a webinar recording that focuses just on how to integrate your logic model into a funding proposal. So the recordings, slides, and the additional materials are available on Evaluate's website. And if you're looking for more information about what makes a good evaluation question, you can see the evaluation questions checklist. So that checklist provides more detailed definitions on the criteria for good evaluation questions that we talked about today. Finally, for those of you who are attending the high tech conference in July, Evaluate is going to be running some one on one logic model clinics. So you'll be able to sign up to spend some time with an Evaluate team member to really look at and discuss your project's logic model or your project's evaluation plan. So we know that you'll be attending the Mentor Connect workshop on Tuesday, but we, we'll have plenty of time slots open on other days and throughout the conference. So signups aren't available yet, but they will be when the high tech program is pu 
published and ready to go so that you can make sure to sign up for a time that doesn't overlap with another session you really want to attend. Okay, so let's stop here and see if there are any questions about how you might apply any of this to your evaluation proposal. I'm gonna hand it over to Samantha. Thank you, Lissa. Uh, yeah, you can go ahead and enter any questions you have in the chat and uh, we'll go ahead and display those and Lissa can answer. So I'll give you a little bit of time to get those entered. Okay, I am, oh, there we go. I was like, I'm assuming we're uh, typing here. Um, Lissa, first question, do evaluators charge for working on evaluation plans for ATE proposals? It's a good question. So evaluators typically do not charge for developing evaluation plans in this pre-award stage for proposals. However, you will see some evaluators who place boundaries around the amount of time that they'll spend. Um, so make sure to really talk about what that looks like up front. Um, the reason they do this is because they go into this partnership with the assumption that they will then be hired on as the evaluator for your project. So again, make sure your institution allows that because you wouldn't want to have a miscommunication between an evaluator team. Okay, and do our evaluation questions align with our SMART goals and objectives? That is a great question. So the SMART acronym, right? Specific, measurable, now I'm gonna forget what A stands Actionable. for. <laughs> Good. So I think uh, that acronym is such a great way to make project goals, right? To make sure you have these clear targets or benchmarks that you're working towards, right? So whether that's number of students, partition rate, participation rates, you know, uh, uh, education materials completed, and your evaluation questions that ask about activities, right, will, and some of the short-term outcomes will overlap with those goals, right? You want your evaluation to ask questions like, were these goals achieved? But you also want your evaluation questions to go beyond those goals, right? You want your evaluation to really explore what was the impact of achieving these goals? Uh, what was, you know, how did this really benefit students and industry in your community? So yes, evaluation questions will align with your SMART goals, but they'll also go above and beyond that. Okay, and you mentioned it could be difficult to collect data or ask questions in the long-term outco outcome section in logic models. Should we still include them anyway or take a chance on identifying them? You should definitely include them in the logic model, right? So make sure you're mentioning what those really long-term impacts of your project will be in the logic model. Um, but whether or not they should be in the evaluation plan is gonna be a question of feasibility. Right. If you are saying that your evaluation plan is going to measure, um, you know, long term career success of students a decade after being involved in your AT initiative, reviewers are going to know that that's not feasible. Right. And so they're going to start questioning that misalignment between the measurements that you want to take in your evaluation and your um, resources and activities. So yes, be like, think big, uh, go for, you know, make sure that your logic model is really talking about this overall system and what you're trying to do in your project. But in your evaluation plan, make sure that those data, that data that you put in there is really feasible and observable. Okay, thank you. And that wraps up the questions we have for now. But if you think of any other questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat and we will uh, tag them and answer them in our next uh, question section. That is a good reminder. So Erica or uh, Samantha and Maureen are in the background um, tagging questions. So you can ask questions whenever they occur to you. 
All right, well, let's move on to the next section. So the next element of your evaluation plan is going to be about data for the evaluation. So this is what information will be used and how will it be collected, analyzed, and interpreted. So these are all distinct things, but we've grouped them together in this section because we can't really talk about one without referencing the other. So in this section of your evaluation plan, you need to describe what information will be used to answer the evaluation questions. So these are the indicators. How the information will be obtained and from what sources. So these will be the data collection methods and how the quantitative and qualitative data will be summarized. So that's the analysis. And then how these findings will be used to actually answer your original evaluation questions. So that's the interpretation. So let's take a look at each of these terms a little more closely. So indicators. Indicators are the specific things you're going to measure so that you can answer your evaluation question. Examples might be the number of educators served, um, students' interest in STEM, or rates of program completion. Data collection is how the information for the evaluation will be obtained. So data collection methods could include surveys, interviews, focus groups, or even using existing student data. Analysis is the process of transforming that raw data into usable information. So this might include identifying themes in a qualitative data set, producing descriptive statistics like means or percentages, or maybe you have the data to conduct some significance testing. So although they're often conflated, analysis is not quite the same as interpretation. So interpretation is what you do to actually answer the evaluation questions, to make meaning out of the data analysis. So this generally involves comparing your findings to another group, a prior year, or a benchmark, or a goal. So let's take a look at Jen's first draft of describing her evaluation data. So take a minute to read the excerpt on the screen and consider what you see um, Consider whether you see evidence of those four data elements that we just discussed. So as a reminder, those are indicators, data collection methods, analysis, and interpretation. And then go ahead and use the chat on the right side of your screen to share your thoughts about whether this description is adequate or how it might be improved. I'll go ahead and give you a minute to read. All right, so we have some comments in. So Adrian said, seems vague. Yeah, there's not a lot of details in here. Valerie says, there are a lot of good keywords, but no solid evidence. Right, there's a lot of like evaluation words in here, right? You see mixed methods, quantitative, qualitative measures, formative and subative. We have merit and worth in there, right? You know, I, I will say something about you know, evaluation words, is that not everyone has the same definition of them. So even terms like formative and summative, these are used so often around evaluation, but one person may use it to mean something fairly different. So my suggestion is actually always just to say actually what you're going to do, right? So instead of saying will be used in formative and summative manner, like actually, how are you going to use it, right? Are you going to use it to make project decisions? Are you going to use it to inform your project annual reports? Are you going to use it to uh, demonstrate your project's outcomes to your college administrator, right? We can be a little bit more specific about that. 
Let's see some other things. Sophia, yes, it focuses on methods, but there's really not much about the analysis. Definitely nothing about interpretation. Yeah, which Jacob points out. Yeah, lacking in the interpretation piece. Yeah, what's being measured? Who knows, right? So as you all mentioned, this description is rather vague. So it could really describe a whole host of evaluation plans. And there's no evidence that the evaluation has really been tailored to the activities or the goals of Jen's project. Unfortunately, we kind of see this a lot, right? Evaluation plans that just feel like cut and paste from other proposals. So you, you wanna be aware of this and be really careful to make sure that you're being specific about the activities um, and the data that you want to collect to inform your project. So, you may be thinking that this is a lot of information to include for just one part uh, of a one to two page evaluation plan within 15 pages that you're already trying to squeeze a bunch of information into. And you're right, you're probably not gonna have a whole lot of room to go in depth about these things, but you do want to demonstrate that you have a concrete plan for collecting and using evaluation data. So an efficient way to present the data elements of an evaluation plan is to put them into a table like this. So here we have the evaluation questions on the top, and then you have, you see the indicators in that leftmost column. So these are the, the data pieces that you're gonna collect to answer your evaluation questions. And then the next column lists the data source, sources and methods for each indicator. Same with the analysis strategies and the interpretation strategies for each indicator. So as you might imagine, using this format, it really forces you to think carefully about that data that you're gonna collect, how you're gonna get it and how you're gonna use it. So using a matrix format like this can really help to strengthen your evaluation plan and show those logical connections between your indicators, data sources, analysis, and interpretation. So if you wanna put your data collection plan into a table like this, we do have some guidance for you in our evaluation data matrix template. So this template includes definitions and examples for each of these components. So in the next section of your evaluation plan, you will need to briefly touch on the communication of your evaluation findings and the use of those findings. So here you should identify what reports will be prepared and who will receive them. So at minimum, you should receive one annual evaluation report from your evaluation team. And this report really should be in advance of your annual project report that you hand in to NSF. So you really wanna make sure that you're integrating the findings from your evaluation report into your annual project report to NSF. It's also good to mention how frequently the evaluator is gonna be communicating with the project team. So this shows that there is a real feedback loop. So I know for the evaluate team, we meet with our evaluator at least once a month um, and that's virtual calls, not in person. So also note that evaluation results will be shared with external audiences that might benefit from that information. So within um, the review criteria for NSF in ATE specifically, they have these checkpoints embedded in it. And one of them says, is the evaluation likely to pro provide useful in information to the project and others, right? And then it also says, will the project evaluation inform others through the communication of those results, right? So make sure to demonstrate that this is gonna happen in your proposal. Your evaluation is primarily for you, the project and the project team, but NSF also wants you to share what you're learning with others so that others can learn from what you're doing. So with that in mind, I'd like you to read through these descriptions of evaluation communication and use from three different proposals, and then decide which you think is best. So go ahead and use the poll uh, that Samantha launched on the right side of your screen. And if you have any additional thoughts and questions, you can share those in the chat box. So I'm gonna give you a minute to read these examples.
So hopefully you've been able to read the examples and we have some answers to the polls rolling in. And it looks like so far everyone has chosen example B. Yeah, so let's take a look at each of these. So if we look at example A, there's really no substantive information here, right? It doesn't really show any awareness that the project should be receiving or using the information from the evaluation on a regular basis. If we look at example B, it does a good job of indicating a commitment to actually using the information and sharing it with others. And then in example C, evaluation is kind of just treated strictly as an accountability function. It doesn't really demonstrate that commitment to using what's learned from the evaluation that we want to see. So keep this in mind as you write your evaluation plan for your proposal. Um, sometimes it feels like you're just not quite sure what to write, so you get something on there, right? But make sure to go back and read it with the lens of a reviewer, of a program officer, and say, does this make sense? What kind of information are they looking for? What information would I be convinced of if I was, a, if I was reviewing this proposal? So if you're not really sure what communication should look like between a project team and evaluation team, check out our communication plan checklist has a number of good ideas to make sure that you are really strengthening that communication with your evaluator. Evaluate also has a checklist on ways to use your evaluation findings. So it can be really helpful to have these as options in mind while you're writing your proposal to really envision how to get the most out of your evaluation. So finally, in your evaluation plan, you need to convey a timeline for the evaluation activities. So you need to identify when the key evaluation activities will take place and show that there's a concrete plan for getting timely information from the evaluation. So a uh, Gantt chart, a matrix, a table, whatever you'd like to call this can be a really great way to do this. So by key evaluation activities, I mean like major data collection events, things like reports when they'll be handed in, um, and meetings with your evaluator, right? So you don't need to include all of the, the detailed things that will happen, right? That will go in a later evaluation scope of work. But for your proposal, right? Again, it's, it's about making sure that your evaluation is aligned to your project activities and that it's getting you helpful and useful information at the right time. So again, you can include the evaluation timeline in the evaluation section of your proposal or within the overall timeline of your project. So here's an overview of the five essential elements that you need to include in your ATE evaluation plan. Identifying an evaluator, listing evaluation questions, discussing your evaluation data, how those findings will be communicated and used, and including a timeline of activities. So to help you present the evaluation plan succinctly within a proposal, we've created a, a, a template for you. So this proposal evaluation plan template shows you how to organize the information effectively. So I strongly suggest that you use this along with the evaluation plan checklist. But there are a few other places that you'll want to integrate evaluation or acknowledge evaluation within your ATE proposal outside of the evaluation plan heading. I wanna take a look at those, but before we dive into that, let's take a quick break to answer any questions that might've come up for you along the way. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Samantha. Okay, thank you, Lissa. Uh, just a reminder, go ahead and put your questions in the chat. Um, while you're working on those, uh, I, Lissa, I do know a common question that we get is, uh, what are some common pitfalls that you've seen in evaluation plans? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so common pitfalls I see or have seen in evaluation plans for proposals. One, um, not justifying the choice of your evaluator. You know, I, I've heard from program officers that they see kind of a disconnect between the evaluator that's chosen and the evaluation activities. So it'll say something like, this evaluation is going to use student assessment data 
and this evaluator has really strong qualifications in interviews, right? But have they done student assessment data? So making sure that you're really justifying that and justifying why the expertise they bring to your project are really going to strengthen your evaluation. Um, another one that, that I mentioned briefly before is that idea of just having this cut and paste evaluation plan. Um, and sometimes I hear from projects and from grant seekers that that's what they're getting from their evaluator, right? That they contact an evaluator, they say, will you work with us? Um, and then when it comes time to get that evaluation plan section to put in their proposal, they get something that seems really generic and really vague. And know that it is your responsibility as the submitting PI to go back to them and say, this isn't enough. This, this is not good enough quality for us, right? We need you to be more specific. We need you to tailor this more to our project, right? So remember, the best evaluations really are a partnership between the project team and the evaluation team. Um, something else I, I just want to mention is this idea of like of unclear connections between the project activities and then the evaluation measures. So sometimes we see that um, there's a goal set around student learning, but then there's no measurement of that student learning in the evaluation plan. So those kinds of misalignments or gaps are really gonna be flagged by the reviewers and by the program officer during that review period. Okay, thank you. And um, Jacob is wondering, what are the most common communication events you see and how many should they shoot for? Uh, he's thinking my existing advisory board, one local and one national conference event. Yeah, um, so I'm assuming that you're asking about uh, points in time in which the project team and the evaluation team meet up and talk about the evaluation. If that's incorrect, please correct me in the chat, Jacob. So for our project for Evaluate, so we have monthly meetings, virtual calls with our evaluation team, and that is really just to check in on what's going on, right? So our evaluation team might ask us, um, you know, we're coming up on this data collection event, is everything set? Or, you know, has anything changed in your activities? Are you doing something different? Um, sometimes we share like this isn't going well, and you know they can help us brainstorm like can we collect information around this to understand what's happening better um so you have those kind of monthly check-in events but then like you're saying maybe you have an advisory board right so we have a um, advisory committee that meets multiple times a year ours meets twice a year and we always have our evaluators join that as well and that is also I was referring to sharing with external audiences. Yeah, okay, so the advisory committee meeting is a really great opportunity for your evaluator to share the findings back. Um, but in terms of sharing your evaluation findings with an external audience, this is something that both your evaluator can do and you can do. So at the end of the day, the project staff, the PI, is the one that owns evaluation reports. So most evaluators will not go and share that I should say most evaluators should, right, not go and share this information about your project at national conferences or anything like that without your explicit permission and, and maybe even participation, right? Um, so I think that between sharing it with your advisory board, sharing it at a conference, I would also add in, um, can you post findings online? Um, it is not required to post your AT evaluation report online, but um, I think that that would be a really great way to make sure that you're sharing those findings, right? Um, there's other ways to do it as well. Like think about blog posts, think about um, uh, like magazine write-ups, right? Anywhere that you see other faculty, other administrators, other colleges are doing similar things as you are would be a really great way to get your evaluation findings and the lessons learned that you've collected about your project. Okay, thank you, Lissa. And that is all the questions for now. All right. Well, I know Let's uh, look at some of these other elements of your proposal 
that you might want to integrate, that you should be integrating evaluation into. So there are four other places in your um, proposal beyond the evaluation plan section where information related to evaluation should show up. So the first section is called results from prior NSF support. So this section is only relevant if you've had prior NSF funding. So if the PI or co-PI has had prior NSF funding. So I'm going to touch on this briefly um, today, given that most of you are new to ETE, but I also want you to keep it in mind for the future. So this section is where you would describe your previous project's outcomes. So reviewers are really going to be looking for evidence of the quality and effectiveness of your prior work and how it's related to your current proposal. So as a reminder, the review criteria for all NSF proposals include intellectual merit, which is about the advancement of knowledge, and broader impact, which is the benefit to society. Next, you'll want to make sure to integrate information about your evaluation into your project budget and budget justification. So you may recall from our previous webinar that funds to support an independent evaluator are required by the ATE solicitation and that these funds must match the scope of the proposed valuation activities. So we talked about budgets in the last webinar, but a good rule of thumb is to plan on spending around 10% of a project's direct budget on evaluation. And this may decrease for smaller projects as well. So when it comes to the budget justification, there are a few aspects you want to make sure to include. So according to NSF's proposal and award policies and procedures guide, commonly referred to as the PAPG, there are three main items you'll want to address. So, oops, I went too far. So first address the hourly rate of pay for the evaluator. Remember the hourly rate of pay. Um, I know sometimes my evaluator gives it in days, so it's a good thing to, to call attention to. Um, second, really justify the time that's required for the evaluation activities. So this should match the timeline and the evaluation activities that are discussed in your evaluation plan section. And finally, outline the evaluator's main tasks and deliverables. So the important part of all of this is that these items are reasonable and justified. So making sure that these numbers don't seem like they're just pulled out of thin air, but they really have some reasoning behind them. So all NSF proposals require a data management plan. So this is another place you'll want to integrate information about your evaluation. So this document can be up to two pages and it must include things like the types of data or other material that'll be generated by the project, the format that data will be collected, policies for accessing and sharing that data, policies for using the data by others, and plans for archiving and preserving access to the data. So the point here is that when each of these items refer to data, they're also talking about evaluation data. So make sure to include evaluation data in the write-up of your data management plan. Finally, all proposals should have references, which are separate from the 15-page project description. So including up-to-date and relevant references to evaluation literature in your project descriptions can help show that the evaluation is grounded in and built on current knowledge and practices. If you're going to use a specific evaluation approach or instrument, provide citations to support its use in your context. So there's no page limit for the references cited document, but you should only include references that you mention in the project description and that are pertinent to your work. So while we don't expect that, um, that you may know these evaluation references, if you're working with an evaluator, it's definitely something that you can point out to them and ask them to help you on. So this is the final section of your proposal that you'll want to include information about your evaluation in addition to what we talked about in the evaluation plan section. So just as the details of your evaluation plan should align with your proposed goals and activities, information about your evaluation should be integrated into various sections of your proposal beyond just the evaluation plan. 
reviewers really like to see that evaluation is intentionally integrated into project activities and that it's not just an afterthought. So before we head into our final question break, I want to remind you that all of the resources we've discussed today are um, available electronically in the handouts tab on the right side of your screen and are in that printed resource book that you got at the winter workshop. So in particular, these include the evaluation plan checklist. So this really is going to be your go-to document because it summarizes all of the essential elements of an ATE evaluation plan that we talked about today. And I want to remind you again, you know, we recognize that a lot of this seems pretty straightforward at first, but it can get messier as you get into it. And it can be really helpful to talk things out with someone who's familiar with ATE evaluation. So remember that Evaluate will be holding one-on-one -on -one evaluation clinics at the high tech conference in, in July. So you'll be able to sit, sign up to sit down with myself or one of my colleagues to discuss your project logic model or evaluation plan. So I know you have some questions. Um, I just want to, you know, if, if you are at the point where you're like, okay, I have all of this, what do I do next? So first, know your institution's requirements for procuring an evaluator. If you know that, then you can move on to searching for an evaluator with skills or experience that will fit your project's needs. Then really develop evaluation questions that are gonna inform your project's learning. Like be curious about your projects. Like what are you gonna wanna know? What are you gonna wanna brag about after? Identify the data that's gonna then help answer those questions. And of course, consider how your project is going to engage with these evaluation findings. How are you gonna use it? All right, with two minutes left, I can stay a little bit afterwards if there are still questions, um, but I wanna go ahead and open it up for questions. Okay, how far back do we go for prior NSF support? Good question. So that section, um, especially if you have a lot of things in there, should you can pick um, the most recent grants, but also the ones that are most relevant. So you will have like a bio sketch also um, that's uh, in the supplementary document. So you'll be able to put that in there as well. But I think any time that you can really make sure that that information in the prior results from NSF support focuses on evidence of outcomes and impact rather than just saying, oh, I was on this grant and I was on this grant and I was on this grant, right? That section is about building trust that you can actually carry out the activities that you're proposing in this proposal and that you're going to have a good impact. Okay, thank you. And the last question is the 10% amount for the evaluator cost based off of the total award or direct cost? Direct costs. Okay, thank you. And that wraps up our questions. All right. Well, thank you.